Well, today we're continuing in our joy movement in our series called The Drip. Everybody say The Drip. And today is part number 12. And so do you know what that means? It means that we only have three segments left. This is a 15 part movement and I want us to finish strong. How many of you all, when you began this year, you said this is going to be your best year ever? Let me see by a show of hands. But we realize that this will not be your best year ever if it's not your best year spiritually. So if you want this to be your best year ever, you got to get on your game. You got to get into the word of God. This has to be your best year spiritually. And sometimes uh, we go through a season where, man, we started off strong, but now we're kind of, uh, I've missed some prayer time. I've missed some church time and the devil wants us to be condemned and guilty. But I'm here to celebrate you today because many of you all have made huge steps. I'm talking about from where you've come from, from your past and from the family you came out of, I think somebody needs to encourage you and celebrate you today. And so for those of you all who have started off this year and you've committed to spending daily time with God, thank you. We congratulate you. We celebrate you, man. Those of you all who jumped into a small group, anybody here gotten into a small group a couple of weeks ago? Come on, man. You taking another evening out of your busy schedule to get into the community of believers? We say thank you for that. We celebrate you, man. That's not a little thing. That's a huge thing. Those of you all who went through growth track and now you're part of the 81 people that's serving on the dream team. We want to celebrate that. That's not a small thing. You don't have to be a perfect Christian. You're taking steps. It's just a step. It's just a step. We want to celebrate that today. Those of you all who took the six month challenge and you're right in the middle of this six month challenge and it might get hard right now, but I'm here to help you today. But I want to celebrate you. And I just want to say thank you so much for going towards God. You know, what happens, especially come to the end of uh, February, is that we forget all about our New Year's resolutions. You know, them things, the ball dropped and you had a feeling, I'm going to lose weight this year and I'm going to read the whole Bible. You got stuck in Genesis. It's just February. You're like, no, Leviticus is where you got lost for real. You got through Genesis. You did that. But Leviticus, you're like, I don't know what these people are talking about. And it's almost like in February at the end, before your spring fling, and before your flesh and spring break and before, you know, because it's easy to make a resolution when emotions are high and the ball is dropping. It's going to be my best year ever. But what you going to do? What you going to do in the fight? What you going to do in the warfare? What you going to do in the temptation? So at the end of February, now you can see what this year is about. And now you can make real quality decisions. And my hope for you is that you won't go back. What I've noticed in 20 years of ministry is this is the season where people starting to, you know, miss church a little bit. I uh, miss prayer a little bit. Uh, kind of just, fall. my pastor used to say it this way. The flesh unchecked will always return to where it was delivered from. So you got to keep word pressure on your flesh. For in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. It always wants to go what's wrong, even though the spirit of the Lord is leading to you, you towards what's right. And this is a season where you got to make some recommitments and say, no, man, I'm going to finish this year out strong. I'm going to live this life that God has called me to live. Would somebody say amen? amen? The word of the Lord, I believe for today is finish strong. Would you get three people around you, touch them and say, you got to finish strong. You got to, you, you got to finish strong. You got to finish strong. On, you got to finish strong. <laughs> and so today is part number 12. What else does that mean? It means that we're coming to the end of this series, but not the end of the movement. And I know that some of you all are here today and you feel a little discouraged, a little stressed, a little sad, even though we've been talking about joy for the last three months, and you feel like, you know, I've been hearing about joy, but I still don't have it. I've been hearing about joy. I've been asking God for joy, but still, I feel sad. I feel discouraged. I feel empty. I feel hopeless. Today's message is for you. I need you to put your foot down today and tell the devil what he is. He's a big fat liar. I know he's telling you that joy is not available for you and you're never going to be able to walk in this oil of joy. I need you to say, no devil, you are a liar because I have Jesus. I have his joy in me and through me. Somebody say amen. amen. And so today's message was built with you in mind and it's entitled this, write this down, properly processing pain. And today is for those of you all who really want to walk in the joy of the Lord, but it's been hard. You feel like you've been going through too much. You feel like you've, man, been through too much. The, the doctor's report um, is too frightening. The betrayal has been too deep. You hear us preaching about joy, but you are almost numb. You're kind of like going through life and you don't want to fake it. So 
you halfway have a smile on your face because you've had so much pain. P-A-I-N. And pain can do two things. It can push you into greater problems or it can push you into greater purposes. It's all based upon how you process your pain. There is a right way to process pain that we all will experience one day. And then there's a wrong way to process the pain. But this is what I want you to know, please write this down, is that pain must be processed. I said write it down, nobody's writing it down over here. Pain must be <laughs> processed. <clears throat> Studies show us that one of the most damaging things that you can do to your brain is live in what we call toxic positivity, where you don't acknowledge the trauma that you've been through so that you can process it and deal with it. In the church world, this is huge because it's all about faith and being positive, and that's important. For we walk by faith and not by sight, but that doesn't mean that you don't acknowledge what has happened, how bad it has been, because you have to acknowledge something before you can ever deal with it. If you were to look at some studies by neurologists and psychologists, they will tell you that the brain has different compartments and the front part of your brain called the frontal cortex is there for critical thinking. And some of y'all need to turn that on and keep it on. My God. My God. The back part of your brain is there for safety. It's all about keeping you safe. That's where you have fight, flight, or freeze. Okay? And it's all about keeping you safe. It doesn't want to risk too much. It's all. And the problem with toxic positivity is that you can bypass your frontal cortex and live life out of the back of your brain. And when you live life out of needing safety and needing survival mode, then you do things like this. This is where we hear people, you know, because in, in church world, toxic, let me explain toxic positivity. That's where, you know, you say, hey, how you doing? And the person's like, man, I'm, I'm blessed. Better than the rest. Never had no stress. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, all this, you know, all this wordplay. Uh, I'm living my best life now. And then you find out they're going through hell. And their marriage is barely hanging on by a thread. And you're like, bro, why didn't you tell me? Because they're living out of the back part of their brain. They're living out of a place where they have toxic positivity, where it's all about surviving and it's all about being safe. Uh, let me give you an example. It's almost like if you ask somebody, hey, you come in a small group? And they, they busy every week. Or they're tired. No, I'm going. I may come next week. I'm just tired right now. My God, are you tired every week? Are you tired every week? You know, most of the time, it's not that they're really tired. It's just that their back or their brain is telling them, don't go. Because if they go, then they're going to have to open up with what's going on in their life. And if I've, done, if I've done that before and I got hurt, now I don't want community. I want to isolate myself and I need to keep myself safe. That's where people, they've went through a relationship before and went through a divorce and now they have living out of the back of their brain, well, I don't need to get married again. I'm better all by myself. And that might be the case for some of y'all, but some of y'all being lied to by the back part of your brain trying to keep you safe. And you now have hardwired your, your, your neural pathways into darkness and, and, you're, and, you're, and you're bypassing critical thinking. Hey man, you want to come to church with me? Well, I don't know if I believe in organized religion. I'm like, who disorganized it? <laughs> You don't go to a disorganized gym. You don't go to a disorganized company. God, I hope not. You don't go to a disorganized grocery store. You can't find the bread nowhere. You, you want everything in your life to be organized. The church should be the most organized organism on the planet because one can chase a thousand, but two of us can put 10,000 to flight. The devil loves it when you're at Bedside Baptist. He loves it. But what are you trying to do? You've had church hurt before. Now I need to keep myself safe and I don't know if I believe in that. You're not even thinking critically any longer. You're living out of the back part of your brain because nobody taught you how to process your pain properly. I'm here to help you today. And so this is what I want you to know. You can grow through what you go through. Oh, yes, you can. And if you and you can process your pain properly. OK, now let's look to the word of God. Are you ready? What does the Bible say about pain, about trials, about tribulations? Now, contrary to popular belief, it does not say you won't have any. Matter of fact, 1 Peter chapter 4, check this out, verse number 12. Let's read it together. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 12. Y'all going to bring it up? For, on the, okay, y'all don't know what you're doing. It's okay. It says, <laughs> dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. 
For these trials make you partners with Christ in the suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy. You got to be kidding me. The wonderful what? Joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. So many times we're caught off guard by the battles we face. You know, you're like, I just don't know. I believe in God. And if God was real, why does he let all this bad stuff happen? Because we're in a fallen, broken, sinful world and there's a devil loose. Do y'all hear what I'm saying? (laughs) Like there's a devil loose in this world, but the Bible says in the back of the book that he's going to be locked up and cast into the lake of fire and we're going to live and reign forever with King Jesus. So we just passing through right now. Don't get tripped out as if something's strange. I don't know why this is. I don't know why they're doing that at the Grammys. This is the world. That's why they worshiping Satan. I don't know why they paying for sex change to a five year old. This is the world. That's why they're doing that. Don't think it's something strange. If something weird or abnormal is happening. No, this is normal. You're going to have to fight for some things. There's going to be some warfare. You're going to have to, after you've done all, stand. You're going to have to say no to some things so that you can say yes to his will and his ways. You're going to, this is not strange. This is the way the spiritual things work. And so then it gives us the answer and it says, instead, be very glad. Don't count it strange, but be glad. No, not, not glad. It says very glad. That means it's synonymous with joy. This is what we've learned, all right? Life is going to be painful at times, but the joy of the Lord can help us endure. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. First Thessalonians, are you okay? I don't know if you came to keep it real today because I did, I ain't got time to play with you. First Thessalonians 4 and 13, it says, and now dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. You know, I've learned that we don't deal as human beings with death very well. We don't. Do you know why that is? Because we've never, we were never created to die. When God created Adam and Eve, he put them in a place called Eden and there was no sin and there was no death. They didn't even eat clothes. But when they disobeyed the command of the Lord, sin came in and when sin came in, death came in. Sin passed to all of humanity through Adam and Eve, and so did death. So we don't handle death very well, all right? But the Bible says this, for those of you all who've accepted Jesus, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So death is not the end of the thing, it's actually the beginning of a new thing. It's not the ending, it's actually the transitioning from the natural to the spiritual. It's not a demotion, it's actually a promotion. So what the Bible is saying when it comes to, and I know some of you all have lost loved ones, people that's been close to you, it says that we don't grieve like those who have no hope. It doesn't say that we don't grieve because it's good for us to grieve. It's actually healthy for us to grieve. It's unhealthy to get stuck there. And some of you all are still grieving about somebody who died 15 years ago. It's time for you to move on, especially if they're in Jesus because they chilling. They chilling. They looking at us like, man, y'all got it bad over here. <laughs> got streets made of gold. He's done woke, wiped every tear from their eye. <laughs> they have no sorrow and no sadness. They with the Lord just partying and doing whatever you do in heaven. I don't know. But what I'm saying is like, We don't grieve like those who have no hope. We have to learn how to process our pain properly. And this is what we found out. This is what we found out. Life is going to be painful at times, but the joy of the Lord will help us endure. John 16, 33. Watch this one. John 16, 33. It says, and this is Jesus. He says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. How many of y'all know there's peace in Jesus, man? There's peace in Jesus, man. He says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, (laughs) but take heart because I've overcome the world. I love it how real the Bible is. He doesn't want us to be sucker punched. And I know some people, they get hit by the devil. I don't believe what's happening. (laughs) Don't believe it. (laughs) You got a target on your back, but his grace is sufficient. And he always causes you to triumph in Christ Jesus. He says, on earth, you will have many trials on earth, you're going to have many trials. Now, my job as a spiritual coach is to get you ready to pass the test when it, when it comes. The test is coming, and I want straight A students in this classroom called a live church, but I need you to know that you're going to have many trials and also some sorrows, all right? That is not a negative confession. It is a reality of humanity, but just because you have many sorrows don't mean that you need to live sorrowful. 
okay? We have to learn to properly process our pain. Are y'all with me today? Yes. Oh, thank you, I believe you, I believe you. I wasn't sure. I told you guys a story when we began this series about how my wife went through cancer and how God really taught me about the joy of the Lord. And I want you to feel me today. Is that okay? Everybody say, I feel you, Pastor. I need you to, I want you to feel the pain that I had in this, that I had to process. At the end of 2020, um, Tabitha was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. And so in 2021, we started with a double mastectomy. That's no fun. Followed by five months of chemotherapy. That's no fun. And 30 rounds of radiation. Um, towards the middle, towards the ending, three quarters of the way through treatment, her body starts to just kind of refuse treatment. I mean, like anxiety, just like, oh my God, too many toxins in me, I'm just done. So at that time, I'm running a church, I'm taking care of the kids, I'm doing everything, and this is what I call probably the darkest moment of my life, okay? I'm trying my best to lead a church, and this is just a dark moment. But one thing that we did from the time she was diagnosed, we would have communion all the time together, and I would pray every day. And around my house, there was a lake, and I would walk around the lake, I would sit there, meditate, journal, and I would pray, and I did this every day. Okay. Now, after a few, few months of doing this, um, I was leaving my place of prayer and I had an encounter with the presence of the Lord. And this is the best way that I can explain it. It was almost like he infused joy into my spirit. That's the best way that I can explain it. Jeremiah said it was like fire shot up in my bones. In my darkest moment, in my most painful moment, I met the supernatural joy of the Lord. And all of a sudden, Nehemiah makes sense that the joy of the Lord, is it Nehemiah? is my strength. That means that whenever you feel weak, you don't need to go to the booze or the bottle or whatever you go to. You need to go to the joy of the Lord for the joy of the Lord wants to give you supernatural strength. And, and, and a lot of people think that it's just natural joy. Oh, I got everything I want. I got a new house. I got a new baby. I got married. No, that, that, that's natural joy. The supernatural joy of the Lord, you have it on the mountaintop and in the valley, in the valley and on the mountaintop. The world didn't give it in. The world can't take it away. And what I learned in my darkest moment is that the joy of the Lord will help me get through. Now, when I I received this joy, amazingly, I became carefree. Like for the next year, all the way through cancer treatment until she got declared healed and beyond that, I had no cares. I mean, I'm just having a good old time because I trusted God. I said, God, this is too much for me to carry. Matter of fact, I had so much joy on me that my wife asked me, she says, do you even care? This was kind of after the fact. So she mentioned it like, I didn't know if you cared. That was better. That's better. All right. And I said, yes, sweetheart, I cared, but I learned to cast my cares to the one who cares for both of us better than I. And some of you all are carrying cares that you should be casting. I took the weight of cancer and said, God, you handle that. And I'm going to still celebrate and still have a good time and have contentment. Now, in this season, I want you to feel my pain. Not only was my wife going through cancer, but two weeks before she got diagnosed, my mom got diagnosed with cancer. In the same way, the day that she got diagnosed was the day we went to settlement to buy this building. So for the next 10 months, we were in a multi-million dollar building project. Now that might not mean anything to you, but to a pastor, you know that's a season of warfare. What I've learned is that there ain't no devils trying to stop the Walmart from coming up, but they're trying to stop the house of God from being built. The, the devil don't care about the hotels and the Marriott's, but he cares when there's a temple of God where young girls are going to be set free from suicidal tendencies. He doesn't want, and that's why whenever your church has a building project, get behind it in your giving, get behind it in your prayer. It is a work of God and there's warfare that happens with it. This is my life. I'm in the middle of all this, taking care of my, taking care of the kids, taking care of my wife, my mom and in the middle of a worldwide pandemic where you can't win for nothing. <laughs> Some people want us to close the church down for 10 years. Some people want us to never close down. You darned if you do, if you, you vaccinated or not vaccinated. I don't give a darn. I don't care about any of that. I just want to love Jesus. And it's amazing. The people that I thought would let me pastor them, I was actually more of their puppet. And you have to make a decision, am I your pastor or your puppet? And I'm never going to do what the people want because I'm called to do what God wants me to do. And so I don't know what you are expecting in this house. And in the middle of that, my best friend dies of brain cancer. Now, I don't know what you're going through, and maybe you're going through more than what I went through, but I want you to use the principles. Because in the middle of that, and I'm talking about my best friend, 
the guy that I had been friends with since I was two years old. I was the best man in his wedding. He was the best man in my wedding. He dies of brain cancer. I leave my wife out of chemotherapy and I fly to Maryland and I sit in hospice with him. In the middle of this most painful season, I pray with him and believe God and then I leave the hospice and a few weeks later he goes home and he, he, he dies, he transitions and goes home to be with the Lord. And once again, I go up to the funeral. And you all don't know that because I'm still preaching. I'm still showing up for you. I'm still giving the word of God because God taught me how to process my pain and walk in the joy of the Lord. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Not just when things are going your way, but when all hell is breaking out, you can get on your knees and get the oil. I'm taking. He wants to give you beauty for ashes. He wants to give you a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. See, see you are in warfare even to get in this place that's why I celebrate you the fact that you're here and at the end of this we're going to worship we're going to worship do you know what worship does it paralyzes the devil do you know what your praise does it stops the devil in his tracks and there's just something about the believer that is able in the midst anyway to put on this garment of praise he begins to remove heaviness it's just something about the person that says he's going to remove my mourning and instead he's going to give me the oil the oil the oil the oil is anybody here dripping in joy? I, I'm, I'm trying to help you today. <laughs> and so anyway, write this down. Pain can push you into deeper problems or pain can push you into deeper purposes. It's your church, your choice. <laughs> it's not your church, but it is your church. It really is. Pain can be a tool in the hand of the enemy to destroy you or pain can be a tool in the hand of God to develop you. The choice is up to you. None of us like pain. Amen? None of us like pain. Other than them people that slapping themselves. Have you seen those people that have a slap contest? And it's like, you get two grown people, they come up and they say, okay, you hit me first and see if you can knock me out. And then if you don't knock me out, then I'm going to slap you and see if I can knock you out. Y'all seen this online? Them people crazy. They like pain. That, but the majority of us, we don't really like pain. Okay? That's why you don't go to the gym. Because... It's going to be painful. And so you make up excuses of why you can't do that right now. And, you know, that's why people don't eat right. Because it would be painful for you to put down the food that you like to start to eat healthy. And you don't want the pain of that transition. So you, y'all, I don't know if y'all are keeping it real today. And um, this is why many people remain single, you know. And it's, it's no problem that you're single. Jesus was single. Paul was single. But many people are single just because they don't want the pain. Because with real love comes risks. If you're going to love a person, you're going to live with a life that is open to where you can hurt me. And because many of us have been hurt before, we say, you know what? No, I'm, I can do bad all by myself. I'm just going to do me for the rest of my life. And you're really not, you really don't mean that. You think you mean that, but you're living out of the back part of your brain. So pain that is not processed can be bad, but not all pain is bad. Okay? The pain of working out produces muscle growth. The pain of hard conversations. You know, there's some people that you need to sit down and talk to, and you don't really want to, but it could produce forgiveness and unity. The pain of going through counseling can produce a better relationship. You know the people that should have been through counseling like 20 years ago? You're like, man, your marriage is tore up. So you got two choices here. You're going to have pain either way. You're going to have pain because you're coming home and y'all ain't even talking to each other. You know what I'm saying? Or are you going to have pain by paying $100 a meeting or whatever it is and sitting down with somebody and helping, letting them help you walk through? You know, a lot of people say, well, I just don't want people in my business. You need everybody in your business right now because your stuff is jacked. So what I'm saying is that you're going to have pain. You might as well do it God's way. So not all pain is bad. But I want to give you five ways to properly process pain and we'll be done today. And these are going to be like simple things. Everybody say simple things. I mean, there, there could be more than this, but I'm going to give you the five that came to mind for me. Five ways to properly process pain. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. Number one, you got to realize that you're not alone. Write that down. First Peter 5 and 9, it says, Stir, stand firm in the faith or stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of sufferings you are. You know, one of the biggest lies of the enemy is that you're the only one going through what you've been through. 
You're the only one that's been abused. You're the only one that was molested. You're the only one that was, you, you was the only one betrayed. You've been the only one divorced. You've been the only one. And I want you to know you're not the only one. People all over the world are going through things just like you. One of the temptations is to come into a church like this and say, man, all these people got their stuff together. They have no clue what I'm going through. And if I was to give a microphone to most of the people that is in this room, oh God, oh God. you would be horrified. No, I'm so, I'm, no, you would be like, <laughs> you'd be like, oh my God, I had no clue. Because now this side of the cross, we've cleaned ourselves up. We're not perfect, but we're progressing. And we've learned to walk by faith and not by sight. But does anybody in this building have a testimony? Anybody here not been saved all the days of your life? Anybody here the messed up sometimes and God has cleaned you up? You're not perfect yet, but you are progressing. You need to know that you're not alone. You know, Elijah went through that. Y'all know who Elijah is in the Bible. He was a major prophet. And he did mighty miracles. If you study Elijah, I mean, he did mighty miracles. I think it's in 1 Kings chapter 19. He has this contest with the false prophets. And man, he wins in a dramatic format. And then Jezebel gets upset with him and says, I'm going to kill you. And he just has these miracles that are happening. I mean, fire falls down from heaven. And now he's running from Jezebel. The next chapter, he gets over here and he says, God, I want you to take my life now. Elijah, this powerful man of God, is suicidal and he's depressed. Isn't that like successful people of our day? There's, there's, it's amazing. The people that we follow that might not even really want to live. The people that we hold up because of the success that they have. And, and it's a trick of the enemy because... We're thinking like, oh my God, you are this man. You are Elijah. God has used you in a mighty way. But on the backside of it, he, he doesn't even want to live any longer, all right? And this is what Elijah says to God. He says, I'm the only one. I'm the only one preaching your word. And God is like, no, you're not. I got 7,000 other people that haven't bowed the knee to bow. Because you are not alone. Your experience, there's so many people. That's why you need a small group. You need to open up to somebody. You will be amazed of how many people are exactly where you are right now, but God has brought them out and he wants to do the same for you. Number two, how do you properly process pain? Daily inward renewal. Daily. Second Corinthians 4 and 16, listen to this one. Watch this, let's read it together. Verse 16, ready, read. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed, what? Day by day for our light. And that's the truth. Like what we're going through, it might seem heavy right now, but in the eyes of God, it's light. It might seem like y'all don't understand me. You don't know what's happening in my life, but truthfully, in the perspective of eternity, it's light affliction. And it's but for a moment. It is working for us, a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So we need what I'm calling today inward renewing daily. This is a discipline, y'all. This is a discipline. It takes work, but you can do it. Inward renewing daily. We need to take our inner health very seriously. Would somebody say amen? It, Right now, mental health is a big buzzword. And everybody's all about your mental health. But I don't think it's just mental health. I think that is important. I also think it's emotional health. And I don't think it's just emotional health. I also think it's spiritual health. Matter of fact, I'll step out on the ledge and say, I think if you get your spiritual health right, it will breathe life into your mental and your emotional health. And what the world tells you is don't worry about your spirit, man, which is your eternal part. And what the Bible says is that we need to be Renew daily in our inward being. Daily, daily, daily. I need to get in the word of God daily. I need to turn off Netflix daily. I need to turn off some movies daily. I need to turn on the word of God daily. I got to meditate on those things daily. I got to inward renewal daily. So how do you do that? Here's a few practical keys. Are you ready? Reflection. We got to get good this year of just reflecting. Thinking back on our lives and where we've come from and the battles that's already been won how God has delivered us. And now my wife is, I think, 20 months cancer-free now. Come on, to God be the glory. I got to reflect on that. So if I ever have another battle, I can go back and say, if he's done it before, he can do it again, right? What about journaling? 
You got to get good at journaling, y'all. If you don't know how to journal, you should Google how to journal. What it is is simply spending time with God, getting out paper, and writing down what you feel. And sometimes I just thought, man, I'm here right here. This is what's happening today. And then you can have a thought and you can process your thought on paper. Like you can have a thought, a negative thought about yourself. I'm just ugly. I'm just fat. Okay. Where does that thought come from? I had this thought today. I don't know where it comes from. I know that I'm made in the image and likeness of God. I'm telling you, you have to deal with your inward self, not just journaling. How about this meditation? I'm not talking about Eastern meditation, which is an emptying of the mind. I'm talking about a biblical meditation, which is filling the mind up with the word of God. So you say I'm the head and not the tail. Even if you're not, you see yourself that way. I'm the lender and not the borrower. I'm above only and never beneath. I'm talking about you say what God says about you. What about positive affirmation? The Bible says that life and death is in the power of your tongue. And you can't say what you see. You got to say what he said about you. And a lot of you all are saying what you see instead of what God said about you. And you got to start to call things that be not as though they are until they are for life and death is in the power of what you speak. What about prayer? How many of us like sometimes I love this question. I can ask believers all around the world. How's your prayer life scale of one to ten? Well, you know, everybody's at a six. Like, why are we always at a six? It's such an important <laughs> discipline. Like, what if we just said, you know what? I don't know a lot of the Bible and I'm not the most perfect person in the world, but if I'm going to be like a nine or a 10 and anything, it's going to be in prayer. Yeah. It's going to be like in connecting to God and declaring and decreeing and binding and loosening. I'm going to connect with the one that made me through prayer. And you know what I've learned about prayer is that you don't have to be perfect in your prayer. A lot of people don't have prayer lives because they just feel like God so far and I'm this sinner, you know, and you kind of pray to God, like in the King James Version, Lord, if you could just, thou looketh at your little -eth son here on the earth, -eth. you know, you don't talk like that. Like, where in the world did you get that language? I never heard you talk like that in your life. Where did you, where'd you get that from? God is not afraid of your rawness. Sometimes your prayer should be like this. I got married to somebody, but this sucks right now. God, I need you to help me with this. These kids are driving me crazy. Everybody else on Instagram look like their kids all nice and put together, but I can't stand these people right now, Lord. I need your help right now. Lord God, you, you know what I'm saying? You told me to be uh, my wife, you know, to love her like Christ, love the church. She get on my nerves. She always telling me what to do, turning off the game. I can't do what I want to do. God, I need you to help me. With the, he's not afraid of you being real. God, I ain't got enough money, man. I've been trying to work this job all this time. These people talking about giving. God, I need you to help me. So I can, like he wants you to come to him. Come to him with your rawness. Come to him and say, this is where I am in my life, but God, I still trust you. He's not afraid of that, y'all. Number three, you got to commit to therapy. How do you properly process pain? And don't just go to therapy. Go and be hot, honest, open, and transparent. Talk about your hurts, your habits, and your hangups. I have committed to therapy, I'm happy to say, as a part of my life. I have. I am not ashamed of it. Because I don't go to therapy because things are bad. I go to therapy so things don't get bad. I love it that I get to pay another grown man and go sit in his office and look him dead in the eyeball so I can tell him all the, the stuff that I won't say to you. Like, I can't, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to pay you. And he's sitting there taking notes like, mm hmm. <laughs> all right, Mr. Psychologist, tell me what I'm supposed to think. Okay, I think the Lord is saying this. And you got to get a Christian psychologist too. Don't get you no unbeliever. They don't know enough yet. We love them, but they don't know enough. You need to get you a man or a woman of God that's discerning and they can cast the devil out of you if they need to, praise God. You need to go to therapy. Go to therapy, you know. We have one here, a contractor, Holly. Holly, stand up real quick. Holly. She opened up service today. She's actually working out of our church and she'll have a table after service if you want to stop by. She does marriage counseling, premarital counseling, kid counseling, trauma, drama, everything. She does it all. If you don't like her, find somebody else. We have a list. You know, my wife, we go to a place here called Karis, which is in Orlando. And my wife right now is in deep counseling, deep counseling. And it's amazing to me because when we first met 24 years ago, she was in counseling. She's 47, still in counseling. Lord, what have I married? <laughs> she come to me like a couple months ago and she was like, okay, Kathy's going to take me through three months of deep therapy. And I just want you to be ready. So now she comes home from therapy tired physically. And so, but the whole thing is, is that you got to be, see, the therapy that she has now is not like the therapy that she had back in the day. 
Back in the day, it was for little things. Now, we have to dig deep. Like she, she sometimes is a little OCD, you know what that is? Where everything, like a clean freak, like when it comes to germs. So we go to hotels. She won't even get under the cover sometimes. I'm chilling like this, right? And she, and she, like, she got towels down, and you know, she done folded everything. She's sleeping fully clothed like this. I'm like, you gotta dig deep, girl. You gotta get, you gotta get, like, what in the world has happened in your life to where you are afraid of dirt? Oh, you grew up in the projects. And, but this ain't the project. This is the rich call. And I don't know what's wrong with you, but you got to dig deep in here. The other day we were, we were sitting in the bed. It was late at night. It's probably 10 o'clock at night. There's this noise outside. She wakes up like, like, do we need to call an ambulance? Do we need to call the police? She thought somebody was fighting outside. It was kids in the swimming pool next door. I said, what is wrong with you? That baby's in the swimming pool. You think somebody's breaking into the house? You gotta dig deep. You gotta dig, you gotta, you gotta dig deep. And some of y'all know you haven't went through a season where you dug deep. You've taken the Bible and you've put it over your trauma. You've put it over your pain. You haven't let the word of God really deal with you. You first have to open up some things and don't do it by yourself. <laughs> you got to open up some things to your therapist. You got to dig deep and say, I need to walk through these things. I need to deal with my daddy wounds. I need to deal with my mom hurts. I need to deal with that rejection and abandonment. Why am I so addicted to pornography? I need to deal with me. You got to process your pain. Are y'all with me today? I'll give you number four because we're going to worship in just a moment. You got to help others. Second Corinthians one says, praise be to God, the father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion who comforts us all in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in trouble. What I've learned about the human experience is that if you're in pain, help somebody else who's in pain and it will help you deal with your pain. Many people say, well, I don't know if I can come to church. I just need to get myself together. <laughs> you always gonna need to get yourself together if that's your MO. Listen. You don't have to have everything together to start helping other people and serve. And what I found out is that as you serve and you help other people and you give back, God used that service to really help you. Some of y'all need to lead a marriage group. Why? To keep your marriage on point. It's amazing that because I have doing life with Ken and Tap of the podcast, I have been really like looking at every area of my marriage and communication and sex life and everything because I have to prepare every single week almost to do a podcast. So I got to live it out because I'm preaching it out because I'm preaching it. I got to live it. Meaning that, yes, it's a bother that people come of your house every week for the small group, but it makes you accountable to prepare some food so that they can eat. And as you feed somebody else, you're actually being fed yourself. Don't you understand how the kingdom works? <laughs> oh, I got to move on. I got to move on. Number five. And this is my last point of how to properly process pain. You got to come to Jesus. One more scripture. Y'all ready? Let's read this one together. This is Matthew 28. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Lord help. Let's read it together. Ready, read. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Woo. This is Jesus. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. That is not what the world says. Now, in the world system, you will be applauded for dealing with your mental health. You will be applauded for therapy. You will be applauded for yoga and exercise. You will be applauded for getting a hobby, spending time outside. You will, you, you will be applauded for fitness and um, traveling the world and going to Dubai. But all breakthrough and healing starts with you coming to Jesus. In the world system, you will never be applauded. You will actually be rejected for coming to Jesus because the devil knows is that everything else might help, but it will not heal. Jesus is the only one that can heal your pain, heal your heart, and give you this oil of joy. And we need to come to Jesus, y'all, like it's a lifestyle. Come to Jesus. This is what I've realized. We're in a day and time where intellectualism is on the rise and people are questioning the Bible or questioning the reality of Jesus, but here's the real deal. There has been nobody else in the world that has died for your sin. I need you to make that real. I'm not talking about like church stuff today. I'm talking about, do you know somebody that's got on a cross for your lying? 
in your stealing, in your competitive heart, in lustful ways? Anybody other than Jesus? Why do we love Jesus? Because he died so that we can live. And what the scripture says to us, if you're heavy laden and burdened, come to Jesus because he wants to give you rest. Can we just take a moment very quickly and just worship Jesus for a moment? Can we kind of, you know, what we're doing on the revival nights with Wednesdays, can we kind of bring that on to Sundays for a moment? Come on, if you want to stand, you can stand. If you want to sit, you can sit. If you want to come to the altar, come to the altar. If you want to kneel down, kneel down. If you want to get on your face, get on your face. Why don't we make this about coming to Jesus? God, we want to know you better today. Revival winds are in the house. Do what it is that only you can do. Let's take a moment and just come to Jesus in our worship.
So, we'll continue this on Wednesday night. I hope that you can make it. Um, bring some other people with you. Um, I'm a revivalist a little bit. I, I love to study revival history. And if you look at the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, you look at the Businessman's Revival, the Azusa Street Revival of 1906, the Jesus Movement. There's a movie out a little bit about that, I think, now. The Toronto Blessing Browns are a revival, Lakeland Revival. If you study all revivals, they're... They all have certain things. Some of them will have manifestations of laughter. Some will have healing. Some will have um, salvations. Um, the revival string that is in right now is just deep repentance. It's like a turning away from the world and turning completely towards God. It's reverence for God again. It's the acceptance of the Holy Spirit. It's the welcoming of the gifts of the Holy Spirit again. It's to say, God, we need you more than we need anything. Do I have anybody that has that sentiment here that, God, I need you more than I need anything? God, I need you. You're my number one friend. It was started by Generation Z, and um, it should be led by Generation Z. But all of us, the boomers, Xers, millennials, we all should be undergirding and praying and help, helping Generation Z carry this next level of the move of the Spirit that's happening. But I think it all starts with repentance. So I'm going to go old school today, if you don't mind, and I want to give you an opportunity to get right with God today. I want to give you an opportunity to be forgiven of your sins, to put your faith in Jesus. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, if I was to die today, God forbid, I'm not certain where I would spend eternity. I'm not sure that my name would be found in the Lamb's Book of Life. You want to be certain with your eternal address. You want to know for sure where you would go when your spirit leaves this body. That's one thing we all know for sure is that we have an expiration date. If you're here today and you've ever sinned in your life, then you're in need of a savior. 
You cannot be as a sinner in the presence of a holy God because of his holiness. And so because of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man, there's a great divide. But Jesus is the gap filler. He is the bridge that brings a sinful man back into the presence of a holy God. Y'all see that? The cross made a way. The cross made a way to bring a sinful man back into the presence of a holy God now where you can be adopted into the family of God. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I have sinned and I want to be forgiven. I'm not offering a religion today, but if you want a relationship with God, on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to be bold and I want you to come down to the front so that I can pray for you all over this altar right now. You say, I'm tired of doing things my way. I want to repent from my way and I want God in my life. On the count of three, come this way. One, two, three, come right now. All over the building, if that's you, say, I want to be saved today. I want to be forgiven today. I want to give my heart to Jesus today. Come on, I want to be a child of God. Just come on down this way, come on. From the back, all the way, come on, come on, come on. Get bold today. Come on, let's get bold. Come on, let's get bold for God. You were bold in the world. You were bold out there twerking. Now you need to be bold for Jesus. Come on, let's get bold today. Let's say, God, I'm done with me. Living for yourself has got you nowhere. Let's say, Jesus, I'm coming to you today. And that's what Matthew 28 is. It's just saying, come to Jesus. I mean, I remember this old school song. It goes, no, it goes like, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust you in his presence. No, that's surrender all. And I surrender all. And I surrender all. Would you come? It's not too late. Would you come? It's not too late. Come right now. Tomorrow's not promised. Come on. Today is your day. I surrender For those of you all who are up here, man, congratulations. What a great decision. Um, you don't have to be a perfect person to be saved, but you do have to surrender. And that's what you did today coming down here. You waved the white flag like, God, I surrender. And we're going to help you grow in your faith. And I want to pray a prayer of salvation with you. The Bible says that when you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. That if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, you'll be saved. And so could you pray this with me, everybody who's here? Say, Lord Jesus come into my heart today forgive me of my sins I repent of my sin and I turn towards you Lord Jesus you died on a cross a long time ago with me on your mind with this day on your mind thank you I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior in Jesus name Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. And he illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right. If you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, 
that it be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow into the ministry of a live church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.